presidential car coming up now. We know it's the presidential car. You can see Mrs. Kennedy's pink suit. There's a Secret Service man, spread eagle over the top of the car. We understand Governor and Mrs. Connolly are in the car with President and Mrs. Kennedy. We can't see who has been hit, if anybody's been hit, but apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. I'm in behind the motorcade, trying to follow them. It looks as though they're going to Parkland Hospital. We're on the road to Parkland. Well, it's been 50 years since the presidency of John F. Kennedy, and there is renewed interest in him today, along with the people that were with him, including his Secret Service agents, who were known as the Kennedy Detail. It is our privilege and honor to have the youngest member of the Detail with us this evening, a man who served Presidents Kennedy through Reagan, and is one of the foremost security experts in the world, Rad Jones. Rad, uh, welcome, and uh, thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Mark. Rad, uh, let's begin with uh, our early year, but the beginning of your career, uh, 1963, you just graduated from Michigan State University, a young man just getting married, and all of a sudden you're hired by the Secret Service, you go to IANIS, you go from Michigan State University, the campus there, and suddenly you're in the presence of the President of the United States and his entourage on IANIS. Can you tell us what that was like? Well, it was kind of hard to imagine. Uh, at the time when you're in that moment, you, uh, you just do what you have to do and you go along with where you're being sent and what have you. But Looking back, it was uh, quite a privilege being raised in a small town, going to Michigan State University, then joining the Secret Service, and then uh, getting married, and then all of a sudden you're at the Summer White House uh, right next to the President of the United States. How would you describe uh, his relationship with the agents? I think it was very good. He, uh, he, it didn't take him long to know your first name and he always uh, communicated well with you. He would uh, joke with you. He was very sharp, not, not much got by him. Mm -hmm. So he was very personal with you and, and seemed to know personal details about all of you. Yes, he was, yes. Uh, you, um, I can remember a situation uh, that we had been in New York City and one of the agents, uh, as the president came down walking through the lobby, mentioned to the president uh, uh, that his family uh, was, uh, was uh, waiting and uh, if he could introduce them to the president and he said mm -hmm. oh sure and uh, when the inner when the, he's talking to the agent's family he mentioned something to them about make sure when you come to Washington if, if you ever come to Washington to stop by the office and it's kind of like oh sure we'll I would do that mr. president <laughs> but uh, we were walking uh, a few days later from the elevator from the residence over to the Rose Garden. And uh, I was behind the president and the agent was next to the president. And the president turned to the agent and said, Andy, he said, make sure that if your parents are in town that they do come by and, and to see me. And the president always took the opportunity when he met a family to say how well he liked the agents on the, on the detail and would use the agent's first name. Mm -hmm. So you guys had a very good working relationship with them and, a, and somewhat of a personal relationship as well. Well, I think, yes, the <coughs> personal relationship has to be good along with a professional relationship because there's certain mm -hmm. times when you have to make suggestions to the president on a, on a, uh, to, to follow me or maybe don't do this or let's go this way. And you have to have that rapport so that the president reacts to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you have that closeness plus also the respect. Now there was an episode, I believe, in which you were involved with one of the president's dogs. Was that, that, yes, did that right. caused you a little bit of consternation? Right. It's mentioned in the book, The Kennedy Detail, which was published, I think, last year. And we had a post that was uh, along the seawall. The president's uh, back of the house looked out uh, into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we would do standing on that post, because it could get boring sometimes, we would pick up a rock and about the size of a golf ball and, and uh, throw it, and the dog would come over and pick the rock up and, and bring it back to us. The dog's name was Prochinko, and that was given to the president by uh, uh, Khrushchev. And it uh, uh, was uh, offsprings of two of the dogs that had been in space. Well, anyway, the uh, president had a habit of when he would arrive from Washington, D.C., come into the residence, he'd come play with the children and come back and come out to the backyard and put a golf ball down and hit it. And this one time he did that and the dog ran over and picked up the golf ball and ran it over and dropped it at my feet. And the president <laughs> looked at me and <laughs> said, um, I wish you wouldn't, you guys wouldn't do that. And I said, yes, sir. Now in the book it describes that I was afraid I was going to lose my job. But I really didn't feel that way because the president didn't intimidate you that way. But I did put a notice up in our command post saying, uh, you know, whatever you do, don't 
throw rocks and have the, have the dog retrieve them back to you. Now, Rad, let's move to the latter part of 1963. And the president uh, had a key, uh, well, it was a campaign trip at the beginning of his uh, 1964 uh, 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 presidential campaign where he went to uh, Tampa and eventually Dallas. Can you tell us so uh, what preparing for that trip was like? Well, for me, it was quite an experience because after spending time on the White House uh, summer detail, uh, I was sent back to my field office in Buffalo in about September. And then I, first of October, I was brought back down on the White House detail. During that period of time, uh, you had to kind of, kind of go through a, what is he, what is this agent really like and is he suitable White House material? So my trip down in October was more or less to see if I was going to be able to be a member of the White House detail, if I had what it, what it would take. And uh, so everything was really new, new to me. You know, the, the rush of the motorcade, the fighting the crowds, the, um, the, where there were only 300 agents at that time. So when you were on an assignment, uh, you could work from early morning till late at night. And you were just moving from one venue to another. And um, if you worked, uh, say, mid the midnight shift, uh, you might have to come in early to work the afternoon shift. and. So you could easily work those 18-hour days, and then you might have, then you'd be on an airplane flying to another location, trying to sleep on that airplane. So it was uh, rest. What you didn't have very much rest. But fortunately, most of the people that were on the detail had been very athletic and and probably were Type A personalities. So we just uh, buckled down and, and worked. But um, the trip into Florida. Uh, it came right on the hills of trips we had in New York and Delaware to dedicate a highway, events in Washington, D.C., and then we're in Florida because the president uh, was starting his campaign early on to, um, to get the Florida vote. Well, he uh, uh, met very large crowds uh, everywhere he went, especially uh, in Tampa. And uh, how was that for you, dealing with the, the crowds? Now, again, uh, another thing people may not realize is that uh, the president is traveling in an open car, especially during campaign season. He wants to be close to the people. And I know that caused uh, you and the agents uh, you know, quite a bit of difficulty, but that was pretty much standard operating procedure for presidents at that time. Wasn't well, we it? had some lar large motorcades. Uh, the president had a convertible. We did have uh, the Secret Service follow-up car behind, which was a convertible with very large running boards. Mm -hmm. So you would be on the running board holding on, um, traveling behind the president's car maybe at 40 to 50 miles an hour with the wind blowing. And, and then if you hit an uh, area where there are a lot of people on the, the motorcade route, you'd slow the car way down and, and uh, you didn't have the tight security along the route in those locations because there just were not enough police and agents to handle that. So you'd have to jump off the follow-up car and then move in beside the president's car and make sure that people didn't get too close or if someone reached out to shake his hand that they didn't pull him out of the car mm -hmm. onto, onto the pavement because some people when they shake hands with the, some, the president they don't know when to, when to let go. Mm -hmm. So then, then the the crowd would dissipate and you'd speed up so you'd have to turn around and jump on the follow-up car. And that's a technique within itself because you could you get off the follow-up car maybe going 10, 12, 15 miles an hour. And you had to learn that technique or otherwise you'd go flying down on the pavement or worse, flying it up under the follow-up car. So for a new agent, it was a rather exciting time and, and I, I enjoyed it. You kind of thrive on that type of activity. Now there were times, uh, especially during uh, campaigning, that the president did not want agents on the back of his car. Well, in, in the trip to Florida, agents were on the back of the car. Mm -hmm. And uh, the president uh, uh, made a comment to the detail leader in, in the presidential limousine that he wanted the agents off the car. Mm -hmm. And the agents couldn't get off right away because we were going too fast. But when the motorcade did slow up for, for the crowd, they were able to get off. And then at the next stop, he mentioned to the agent in charge that he, he didn't feel that he could get elected if it looked like that he was being hovered over by security agents. And of course, he also wanted the crowd to see him. And uh, there again, that shows the president's consideration because he wanted to make it known why he didn't want the agents on the cars. 
sometimes uh, I've seen presidents just say, I don't want you here, and that's it with no further explanation. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was very concerned <coughs> about that appearance, and he, and he w very much was a president of the people. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, evident in the, in the way, way he acted. Mm -hmm. Now, how would you describe the, uh, uh, the reaction of the crowds uh, and the size of the crowds that you uh, encountered in uh, uh, Tampa and Dallas? No, oh, they were very excited. You know, they were out in numbers. Uh, there's a large Spanish community, and, 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 and so they were out in numbers. There was a, uh, people were excited to see the president. Uh, and uh, he had a distinguished look about him, and he enjoyed the crowds. He reacted to the crowd, and he'd take an op every opportunity he can to mingle with the crowd or slow the motorcade up so um, they could get a better look at him. Yes, he very much was a people person and, and liked connecting uh, mm -hmm. with the people. That's right. And was uh, quite popular, oh, as well as uh, Jackie was, too. I right. Really, I don't that's think I've right. heard him at all. No, that's <laughs> right. I think she was a, that was a big reason she came along on the trip. Uh, that's true. Because she was such a great campaigner. That's and right. together they were just a you know, fantastic couple. Right. So as we move on to um, uh, Dallas, and obviously um, you know, we come up on the 50th uh, anniversary of the assassination, uh, the, uh, the conspiracy theories never seem to stop. It seems like every every day there's a new one, and there was a poll taken a few years ago about what, what people believe about the assassination. It, it uh, stated in this poll that uh, more people believe the Oliver Stone version of uh, the JFK assassination than what really happened. And I just want to ask you a couple of questions about that. Um, first of all, I think people should uh, just examine the facts for themselves. But let me ask you this about Lee Harvey Oswald. Consider what he did. Was it uh, was it entirely possible for him to uh, do this on his own without help? Did he really need help to do this? I don't believe it that he did. I'm, uh, I, I've never seen anything in my work with the Secret Service. I haven't read anything that's of any substance that would indicate nothing else that Lee Harvey o Oswald acted alone. If, you, if you're in Dallas, uh, you need to go to the book depository. And you need to see where Oswald was at. You need to see how the shot was made out and how the second and third shot, where that occurred at. And uh, I think you'll come away with a different feeling about that it would be possible for one individual to have committed the assassination. There's a lot of, uh, there's all types of conspiracy theories. I think the first conspiracy book written was done in December 63 only a month after the assassination. The Warren report wasn't even finished. And there's been some excellent books uh, written uh, on uh, the investigations and, and disputing the conspiracy theories and like that. After the, uh, my time on the White House detail, I, sp I spent uh, five, six, seven years in what is called the protective research section of the Secret Service. We implemented a lot of the recommendations made by the Warren Commission we doubled from 300 to 600 agents. But during the time that I had in protective research, uh, our responsibility there was to investigate threats and prevent someone from committing assassination against the president. And we prevented a lot. And most of them follow the same similar p pattern that and background of Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a, a direct evidential link between Oswald and any other person, persons, entities, countries, or whatever that ties m more than Oswald to the assassination of the president? I've never seen anything that would do that. Of course, a conspiracy theorist can have all types of links. Uh, there were, that Oswald was in the first floor of the book depository, couldn't be up there, and there were witnesses on the ground that disputed that, that saw uh, a man up in the, in the window and saw a a weapon come out and saw shots fired. And if you go back and you really study it uh, and don't take the, what I call the easy route by just reading something without delving in uh, to what three or four different experts might be saying, uh, you, you might believe a conspiracy theory. But on that day, I was following the assassination. I, I did not make the trip to Dallas. The follow-up car was assigned to was behind the president. Mm -hmm. And I changed with another agent. In fact, we flipped a coin, and he made the trip, and I didn't. 
And the day of the assassination, when that happened, I went into the White House and I was uh, then sent over to stand in front of the Vice President's office, LBJ's office in the Executive Office Building. And when the agents arrived back with uh, LBJ, including not only uh, the Vice President's uh, detail, but also the, uh, the White House detail, the President's detail, uh, every person said they looked to the rear when the shots went off. There was, uh, there was no doubt in their mind that the shots came to the rear. The agent who took, uh, who's, who took my place was a gunman. And uh, he was reaching for the weapon. Another agent had already grabbed it, but uh, that agent turned and, and looked toward the rear. And, and the agent who took my place had his revolver out and, and looked to the rear. So I don't, you hear the shots from the grassy knoll. And if you look at the evidence and you look at testimony by police officers and agents and other witnesses on the ground, they'll indicate that the shots came from the rear. Right. Now, uh, you've been to the book depository building. You've, you've seen the, uh, the site from where Oswald uh, took the shots. Do you think it was um, a, uh, a very difficult uh, uh, shot to do? No, it wasn't. The, uh, when the motorcade came down to make the left hand turn mm -hmm. to get on, uh, to, to head toward the expressway to go to their next stop, the limo had had to make a uh, almost a, a left turn and, and a little bit more coming back the other direction and so it was going very slow and it was picking up speed uh, at uh, at a slower pace because there were crowd there were crowds there so mm -hmm. again the president wanted to be seen by by the crowd mm -hmm. and uh, there is uh, some testimony made and and the driver of the limo did mention that uh, he let up on the gas after hearing the first shot. And, uh, and that hesitation might have uh, allowed uh, the second and third shot to hit his mark a little bit easier uh, because the limo would have to pick up. And, and don't forget, you're dealing with an armored limousine. It doesn't have a pickup uh, that a race car It's a very has. heavy car. A very heavy car. And the car was traveling at about, what, 10 to 15 miles an hour? Less than that. Less than that. Less than that. When he made the turn, it was probably traveling four or five miles an hour. Moving straight away from the And then, then it was building. picking up speed, getting away. And, of course, in a motorcade, when you're operating a motorcade like that, you don't do what we call jackrabbit starts and stops because you have to keep the motorcade together. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you get a gap in between the cars, and that's a, that can be a security breach. So you want to keep keep the cars close together. together. Well, I think uh, uh, so many people just don't want to accept the fact that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald uh, was capable of performing this and then d acted on his own. He was 23 years old, uh, ex-Marine. Uh, he had uh, marksman ability. And unfortunately for all of us, uh, it, was a, it was a situation where uh, the president uh, w was, in a, was in a very vulnerable uh, situation, and uh, there really wasn't much else that, that uh, he could do uh, in that circumstance. Now, as far as uh, the communication between you agents, again, 1963 is not like today. The rings of security are, are far fewer back then, and y you had a far less of an ability to communicate uh, with each other uh, during that process as well. Well, the, you didn't have the radios. Right. Then you had a, maybe a big brick, what we call big brick radio, and that just wasn't, you couldn't carry that. And so it was almost like a basketball team that you're used to playing with each other, you're used to playing together. You, you, it, you know how each other is going, going to move. And, and so a lot of it was done by instinct and the training, mm -hmm. something like that. Of course, at the time of the assassination, with the agents not being on the back of the car, you know, there was, you had to react to that first shot. The first shot is free. And you had Clint Hill that made it to the car, right. which was an impossible uh, thing to do. When you look back at it, he was, uh, must have been really pumped up on the adrenaline. You had an agent on the right front that got off, but couldn't make it to the limo, and he was called back. And I think the agents who were in those two positions, I know I've, uh, Clint Hill especially, and, and the other agent have, probably taken it very hard throughout their life because they think if I would have been on the back of the car, I could have uh, protected the president. Yes, I know he's uh, blamed himself and said so in, in interviews and, and in books, and uh, his, certainly his reaction time was pretty remarkable. Oh, it was. It Considering was. I, I think he, his uh, training served him well and he did all that he could. Oh, yes. 
Now, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, how this has affected uh, the agents as individuals, and also how it affected the Secret Service subsequently. And uh, first of all, how did uh, the agents handle this in the aftermath? Was there discussion? Did, did anybody review things? What, what was done among the agents uh, uh, subsequent to this event? Well, when the agents came back, of course, they were asked to write reports on what had happened. And so they did that. But in, the, in that day, there was no post-trauma counseling. And when the book came out, the Kennedy detail, what the agents noticed and what we uh, commented on and didn't realize is that we'd never spoken about it. The agent whose place I took, Glenn Bennett, who's now passed away, or who took my place rather to Dallas, um, we rode together after the assassination uh, to the White House and, and to our assignments, and we never talked about what if I would have been there or, or that. And I asked Glenn a question about uh, what he wanted to do in his career, and he just made the remark to me, I'd never want to go back, back out on the street again. It had a tr tremendous impact, impact, on, impact on him. But uh, all the agents who were on the Kennedy detail or had been associated on the summer detail on that, we never talked about it. Uh, you came back, you, uh, you continued to do your work. Uh, agents were put with a, with a vice president, uh, but with the president, Mrs. Kennedy was up in New York later on after she left Washington, D.C. I was on that assignment for a while, and I do not recall ever talking to Clint Hill about that day or Clint Hill talking to me about that day. Uh, it just wasn't on our radar screen. Now, maybe we probably suppressed it, uh, but uh, again, uh, looking back at that time, people were in law enforcement, it was kind of a... a well, you're expected to see tragedy. You're mm -hmm. expected to see problems, but you know that's what you're trained for. That's how you're made up, and so you should continue doing your job. And and you just didn't talk about it. It wasn't that type of therapy then. What did you think was the uh, general feeling among the agents uh, in the aftermath? Well, I, there's no doubt that the Secret Service failed. I did an interview at the Book Depository. Uh, a few years ago, historical, they were interviewing agents who had been on the Kennedy detail at that time. And I made the comment that I, I think that every, you, you wonder, how would I have acted? I wonder if I would have been in the follow-up car. I was an excellent shot. Uh, my reactions were good. Uh, could I have gotten the gun out and fired some shots at the window? Wh what if? What if I would have done that? So there was a feeling that we did not do the mission that we were supposed to do, and that's to protect the life of the president. And so I'm sure every agent, like I did, you, you even, uh, I'll think today, second guess myself. I'll re I rel relive the time when I was in a motorcade or an event happens, and could I have acted differently, or, or what, what could I have done to prevent that? So well, I think all the agents live with that. That's part of the problem when, it, when it's not discussed because you, you're not disseminating the facts as a, as a group. And uh, th there was uh, no chance for anyone to, to stop uh, the bullet in that circumstance. I think the, it's clear when you look back on it and see the films and everything else that the Secret Service did all that it could do. And the reaction time of Clint Hill was, was quite strong, very quick. I don't think anyone could have reacted quicker and uh, but but in a circumstance like that, you're you're training you're trained to protect the president, and, and in that case, it didn't happen. However, uh, in the circumstance you were in, it was basically impossible to protect the president. Now, has the training of the agents changed because of this? And uh, is there uh, more discussion after events today, or if, if one occurred today, would there be more discussion about that event than would have occurred in 1963? Well, I think the training is fundamentally the same. Mm -hmm. as it was the protection theory cover and evacuate is it, it's the same I think the the training methods are a lot more sophisticated the mm -hmm. facilities are a lot more you can do a lot more things with the laser uh, weapons and, and all like this it really puts you on a real-life scenarios and we just did not have that uh, technology back then mm -hmm. and then also the agents uh, 
after an event like that, there is post-trauma counseling. I talked to some of the agents who were up in uh, New York during the terrorist attack on 9-11, 2001, and Secret Service did lose their office building, and some of the agents were out rendering first aid to the victims that were on the ground right after the first airplane strike. And all of them went through post-trauma counseling. And, uh, and that's just the way uh, it is done in, in the law enforcement uh, community now that after an event like that, that you do receive that type of counseling. But back then we didn't, and, I, and certainly, it certainly certainly helps. I think so. Yeah, was, I think your experience was very similar to the people who came back from World War II. They were very reticent to talk about their experiences, and it's similar to a war experience, and uh, people are very reluctant to talk about it. But uh, finally, after all these years, m more is being discussed. Do you think this has been very helpful to, to you and the other agents involved in this? I think the writing of the book has been helpful. I know uh, uh, several times that I've personally broken down have have been right after the book was written when I uh, look back and, uh, and and even though I wasn't there but was associated with the family and, and all like that and uh, and also thinking what the other agents who were actually there went through and how that's impacted their lives and knowing what what they went through and and how we could have better done it um, recovered better if we would have communicated with with each other mm -hmm. well in uh, in closing uh, uh, after all this time has passed, the, the uh, more information is, is coming out. Uh, what are your thoughts and feelings about the information that is coming out so far? Are, are you happy that this is finally happening? Is, is this, uh, I know this is kind of difficult for you guys uh, to, to uh, bring forth some of the information, but do you think on, on the overall sense it's, it's, this is helpful for everyone? I, I think it's excellent. I think uh, Jerry uh, Blaine, when he wrote the book, The Kennedy Detail, Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things he wanted to do, I remember him telling me, he said, I, I want to get out the message of uh, what, uh, what it was like to be a member of the Secret Service during that period of time when there was only 300 agents and uh, we were working multiple stops and, and working tremendous uh, long hours and that. And also want to uh, have the agents who were there uh, right around the, uh, the assassination to talk about uh, uh, where the shots came from and exactly what happened. Now, whether people will believe that or not, you know, if you go on the internet, you'll still s see people make a comment about the book and say, ah, oh, really, that didn't happen or like that. But the only thing we can do and the agents can do who are there is tell their story. Whether people believe it or not, that's up to them. But there's no reason for the agents to lie. There's no e reason for us to say anything that's not true. It, uh, it, it, it uh, we'd have nothing to gain by that. But I, I think the book and what's going on now is an excellent way to get the story out. I think so too. And I think uh, you guys, uh, uh, some of you are eyewitnesses to the event and you were there. And, uh, and, and all of you were part of a team, whether you're in Dallas or not. And I think your story needs to be told. And I'm so grateful that you uh, came out this evening to, to uh, share your story uh, with us. I know the uh, Kennedy Detail book was published in 2010. I know the uh, gentleman involved in that have toured the country and given a lot of interviews regarding it. And uh, I know that there is a movie uh, coming out uh, later in 2013 uh, on the Kennedy detail. And we're looking forward to that. And uh, uh, thank you for sharing uh, your story. Uh, I think it's an important one for all Americans to hear. And uh, uh, people uh, should pay better attention to history and it's not accept everything that the, they see in uh, uh, films by Oliver Stone and other such sources of information. I think they need to hear from the people who are there. Well, thank you for having us. You're welcome. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed watching. Live long, live long profiles. We'll see you next time.